If you've been wondering about what the best therapies are to help heal from trauma, then tune into today's episode. Today we sit down with New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Pedram Shoje, and author, producer, director, Nick Polizzi. Nick and Pedram share with us insights from their book, Trauma, Healing Your Past to Find Freedom Now. Join us as we discuss the ways in which trauma can show up in your life, the relationship between the gut and trauma, and how to know when it's your trauma that's driving your actions versus your authentic self. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. In today's episode, we talked to Dr. Pedram Shoje and Nick Polizzi. And this is a really fun episode because Pedram and Nick are actually best friends. They haven't even seen each other for a while. So they were both on the Zoom call. So it was kind of fun. The two of them got to hang out and joke around a little bit too. It's a really light and fun interview. But they re- they've done a number of projects together and they've both done some really incredible work on their own. But they both came together to write this book, Trauma, Healing Your Past to Find Freedom Now. And we wanted to go through some of that work with them. The book's a pretty in-depth book. It covers a lot of different information. It looks at a lot of different therapies as well. And it looks at a a whole body approach to working with trauma. So not only does it look at some of the therapies you might be familiar with, with say like EMDR or neurofeedback or um, traditional counseling or some of these different um, mind-body sort of Um, processes too, or getting back into the body, some of these exercises, but it also looks at the physiological part of it. It looks at the importance of like diet and nutrition and gut biome and all of these different things. So I really liked discussing with them because they have a very holistic approach to trauma, which is sometimes different than the straight trauma recovery work that we often hear more about or more from a psychologist or counseling or psychiatry type of point of view. So we get into some other pieces that they also are very well uh, knowledgeable about. So we get into a bunch of different stuff. We talk about the role of the vagus nerve and how to even normalize the vagus nerve. We talk about how do you know when you are acting from a place of your trauma, almost unconsciously, versus acting from that authentic self. I think that's a really important piece to address because so often I think we go through life almost habitual through our patterns and a lot of our patterns that we've created through periods of history of trauma, those become strong ingrained patterns. And the next thing you know, we're just living our life in a way that's creating the same sorts of problems over and over again. So there's some insights around that that I think are really important. We look at how the media and entertainment industry play a role in creating even more trauma in our lives. There's so many really important pieces in this episode that I'm excited to share with you. Now, before we get started with the episode, I just want to thank C60 from Purple Power and for sponsoring this entire series. And if you're not familiar with C60, go check them out. You can check the link below or you can go to the website inspiraledpodcast.com. Click the link on the top right corner and you can get 15% off your order. Just use the promo code Dr. Loken, that's capitals D-R-L-O-K-E-N, and you'll get 15% off your order. C60 is that really incredibly powerful carbon 60 molecule that is this really powerful free radical scavenger. So really in incredibly powerful antioxidant and it affects many underlying causes for illness. It supports a lot of different underlying pathways like oxidative load and inflammation and a precursor to some of the primary hormones in our bodies. So I want to just take you through a couple of things that maybe you're not aware of, but C60 outside of We've talked a lot about mental health because of this series and trauma, but outside of that, it can help with athletic performance. It supports healthy aging. That was where some of the original research was done on healthy aging. Rat studies showed that the rats that were taking the C60 had doubled their lifespan compared to the other rats that weren't. Supports healthy joints, supports immune function. And something that I think is really interesting is that it also promotes a healthy libido. Now, if you want to have a healthy and a happy longer life, then it's actually really important to support libido. And I actually find even younger, younger than I would normally expect it, I'm finding healthy young men and women already with very low libidos. Now, there can be a lot of different reasons for that. There's lots of different psychological reasons. Sometimes we're not happy with our partners or we're not attracted to them or all of these things. But I would say more often than not, that's not the issue. Most of the time it's because our energy's low and it's because we are 
often under so much stress that when cortisol goes up, testosterone goes down. And when cortisol goes up, we start to steal pregnenolone. Pregnenolone starts to, which is the primary precursor to making our sex hormones, both testosterone and estrogen. So both for men and women, if libido is low, C60 can be one of those pieces that may support it. Because when you add C60 in, it starts to support pregnenolone again. And then you start to get enough pregnenolone to support natural pathways that support making enough testosterone, making enough estrogen for what your body needs. And when you're under stress, we start to run low on pregnenolone. This is partly the problem. We're using it to make cortisol as opposed to using it to make these sex hormones that actually make us feel younger and healthier and happier and more full of energy. So if that's one of the things that's there, C60 may be one of the products that could be supportive for you. So check it out. Like I said, click the link below or the link on my website up in the top right corner and you'll get 15% off your order. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I look forward to talking to you soon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And as we continue on with our series on trauma recovery from surviving to thriving, today we've got two guests, Nick Polizzi and Dr. Pedram Shoje. And they've written a book together called Trauma, and we are going to go into that, Healing Your Past to Find Your Freedom Now. And I'm going to give a little intro on both of them, and then we'll dive right into it, guys. So Nick Polizzi is a producer and director of feature-length documentaries about holistic alternatives to conventional medicine. He's the founder of The Sacred Science, director of the feature documentary by the same name, and author of the book based on the film. He is also the co-author of Exhausted and Trauma, Nick's mission as host and executive producer of the docuseries Remedy Ancient Medicines for Modern Illness is to honor, preserve, and share powerful evidence-based healing technologies with those who have been failed by modern medicine and the system as a whole. He's been traveling the world documenting forgotten healing methods ever since he cured himself a debilitating illness at age 25 using a traditional therapy. And Dr. Pedram Shoje, is a man with many titles. He's the founder of Well.org, the New York Times bestselling author of The Urban Monk, Rise and Shine, The Art of Stopping Time, Inner Alchemy and Focus, and co-author of Exhausted and Trauma. He's the producer and director of the movies Vitality, Origins, and Prosperity. He's also produced several documentary series, including Interconnected, Gateway to Health, and Exhausted. In his spare time, he's a Taoist abbot, doctor of oriental medicine, a kung fu world traveler, a fierce global green warrior, an avid backpacker, a devout alchemist, a qigong master, an old school Jedi biohacker working to preserve our natural world and wake us up to our full potential. Guys, great to have you on the show today. Thank you. I feel like my bio is exhausted. Who did I write this book with? This sounds like, (laughs) who is that guy? I don't want to do all that. Um, it, it's actually an older bio. bio after because, yeah, I actually sold well.org last year and now it's whole, t- whole TV's the, the new gig. But, um, you know, that's. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll add that one into the show notes then. So, we cool. got it up there. <laughs> so Pedro, as a, as a fellow Persian, can you please tell me how uh, an old school Persian became a Jedi? Yeah. Um, uh, can we cuss on this show? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, look, you grow, you grow up as an immigrant, um, you know, dealing with uh, the formulas. My dad was an engineer and, you know, in, in our generation, doctor, lawyer, engineer, those are your choices. And uh, I went straight to UCLA, number one in my high school, ready to do the doctor thing. And then I got to hang out with doctors and the guys that I was attending uh, with and interning with were just miserable. And I was like, wow, I want this guy's life. Um, and it really, it shook my foundations. I had some very mystical experiences that drove me into reading about stuff. And then I found a Kung Fu master and grew up watching Jedi stuff. And I was like, holy crap, connect the dots. Um, I want to be a Jedi. And so um, just changed, changed course trajectories. Um, parents were pissed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I said, look, you, you know, I won't ask you for money. <laughs> no, it, it solved a lot. <laughs> and your last name, Shujai, that actually means of courage. Yeah, brave one. Yeah, yeah I got a lot of uh, scar tissue to, to prove it. Um, it doesn't always work out, but um, yeah, it's definitely a part of a personality that, that leans forward here. Mm-hmm. Very good. <laughs> nice. And Nick, how did, you, and how did you get so interested in alternative ways of healing? It's a long story, um, but I'll try to sum it up. 
it really came from my own illness when I was in my early 20s. I come from a, a long line of, of uh, medical, uh, modern medicine fans, um, a lot of nurses in my family, doctors. Um, and I came down with a severe, um, a severe illness uh, in my early 20s. And my, my family wanted me to do the modern medical route. And um, it didn't work. I tried everything, didn't work. And like many people, I was failed by, by the what's out there and had to turn to other methods to heal myself. And, you know, this is a very common story as we kind of get into these methods of healing, including trauma, where people out of desperation try anything. And that's kind of where a lot of the, the amazing breakthroughs happen and where a lot of the, you know, the, the bleeding edge of what we're doing starts um is is that is that that kind of a mentality so yeah out of desperation i started trying a lot of other things and within six to 12 months my migraines and my brain issues were completely gone wow well and like you said i think it's like as soon as you have exhausted everything that you can think of exhausting you open up a different space for willingness and then you just kind of let go of it all and are open to anything that's gonna start to help so and that, that in itself, I think then you open up a space to actually allow something like that in. So that's I mean, pretty phenomenal. And then you guys came together and wrote this book called Trauma. So, yeah. And uh, after going through a lot of the information for this series, you guys cover a lot of stuff in your book. I mean, it's a, it's a really good it's a really good template to cover a lot of pieces to give people some different perspectives that they can approach. So I find a lot of times with trauma, it's like there's, you know, specific areas that people write about. You guys do a really good overview, pulling in a lot of different resources to give some direction for people. What, um, what brought up, what caused you guys to want to get together and write a book on trauma specifically? I mean, we're all so traumatized. <laughs> you know, Nick and I have been talking about it. Nick and I have been <clears throat> friends for a while now. And, you know, we've done some projects together. We've, you know, support each other in films and, you know, just kind of behind the scenes, uh, the conversation just kept bubbling up about how the elephant in the room, the, the, the thing, the unspoken element in all these health crises and all the stuff that's going on, all the crap that's happening in the world is all this unresolved trauma that no one wants to yeah. talk about. And, um, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's just this balloon that keeps inflating and um, isn't like, you know, pops in really bad ways uh, culturally. And, you know, it just, it just became clear that this body of work really needed to come out, especially in the last, you know, few years as, you know, our society is getting polarized and, you know, just all these vets are coming back and, you know, the resolution isn't there. And the problem is, you know, it's, it's cascading in a way that's going to turn into a very big disaster. Um, health, interpersonally, societally, I mean, just all the stuff that happens in trauma. And so we took it on. We did a 10-part series and, and wrote a book. I mean, we, we've been in this for a couple of years. Yeah. I think the notion, the, the idea is that Pedro and I have had a lot of long conversations um, in the last decade about where we come from. And we realized that we're both, we kind of have these pretty traumatic type childhoods and we were able to kind of funnel them into and derive a lot of things from them that have helped us, you know, become who we are now, but there's still so much scar tissue there that it just felt like um, a really ripe thing for us to, for us to make a series about, um, even though it's there's things le there's lessons you can learn from all this all this stuff that happens to you and everybody no one escapes childhood without trauma which is something that you start learning about when you start digging into the literature no one no one is untraumatized everybody has some mm -hmm. so um, the more we go we look into you know the new the new studies in alternative medicine holistic medicine like this stuff that not only leads to further complications down the line mentally, but it is also being linked to disease, like actual, like physical diseases. So it's at the core, it's at the root of what's ailing a lot of society right now. So how would you guys define trauma? Because oftentimes when people hear the word trauma, they're like, well, no, not me. Um, but I, I, we agree with you wholeheartedly. I feel like we've all been traumatized on in some sort of way on some sort of level. So what would be your definition of trauma? for Nick. My definition of trauma is, and I think this kind of works for both physical and emotional trauma is 
something that happens, an injury that happens that isn't properly healed and is left to fester over time. And what, what, what that can manifest as is what we would call trauma. Now traumas, we have a really fun way in our culture of just slapping a label on things and then thinking we know what it is, which is pretty much a whole other existential conversation that we could have later. Um, but trauma is not, is obviously just a word, you know, that is trying to encompass a huge realm of realities for people. But I think if I want to try to put it simply, which I am sad to do, I don't want to do it, but if that's what I would say. It's, it's, a, it's an injury that wasn't properly healed, whether it's emotional or physical and has been left to, faster and now is starting to manifest in other problems in your life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what those other problems are, because sometimes I think when people aren't aware that they are dealing with trauma, sometimes you can almost, almost like uh, reverse engineer it. It's like, what are some of the things that are currently going on right at the moment in your life that are maybe not being resolved that might then bring you back to even looking at what might have been an underlying trauma cause for it. What are some of the ways that it can present in people's lives? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> it's an hour long podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, pretty much everything. I mean, every, every time one of my kids annoys me and I, you know, have an instinct to either smack them or yell at them or something that, you know, happened, you know, w w yeah. in generations before that we're trying to correct now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, every time you see someone get bullied and you get triggered, every time you see someone get angry about something that invokes anger in you from a memory that's associated with kind of an energetic limbic um, loop that you get stuck in. I mean, honestly, when you start looking at trauma, there's not, an hour of your day, and I would argue not a minute of your day, that something that is um, logged in the limbic system with a, a, a memory, with an emotion attached to it, doesn't boot up and cross the, the, the desktop of your mind. Every minute of your life that has some sort of traumatic imprint that has gone unresolved because what do we do? We go to school, we get jobs, we buy stuff, we just keep going forward. Our culture is not oriented towards looking back and healing and resolving and coming whole. And so we just march forward and buy crap out of containers from China and everything's fine until it isn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're at a until it isn't kind of moment in our culture mm -hmm. and it's time to talk about it. Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> From a physical perspective, what do you find that comes up a lot for people? I know things like that a lot of times people wouldn't necessarily categorize first as being related to trauma, but things like digestive issues, like weight gain, um, chronic pains. Like what have you guys seen personally and, and, and also with different people that you've worked with? What are some of the things that you see come up all the time? Nick? Well, one, I mean, I'll just take, take it one avenue and then Pedram will take it the exact opposite way. Um, so <laughs> that's, something that's that, how we met. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's interesting because I mean, there's, there's sort of a crossover here, you know, you have, we're talking about, you know, I guess I would look at it as emotional and physical being two separate categories, but there's, there's crossover too. Like I have, to, <laughs> I'm like my own, my own guinea pig in a lot of what I do. And so is Pedram. Like I, I have severe triggers to certain things that I thought everybody, that I thought everybody had. And I think that that's one of the common, common beliefs is that we're just trying to be normal. We're trying to be, we're trying to be like the rest of society. And a lot of times we overlook how unique we actually are. So, so sometimes things that occur for you that, that are uncomfortable are unique to you. And so when I went down my own rabbit hole, and I started looking like at why I have these problems, why I have these triggers to things, why a loud noise in my house turn, makes me see red and I have to kind of go walk outside for a second and like just be away from my family for a second. Start trying to understand what that, what that was caused by. And so looking back into, you know, the two different kinds of trauma, you know, I was like, oh, maybe it's because I had like these tough things happen when I was younger. Maybe it's an emotional thing. But then doing something like neurofeedback, which is a whole different, different part of trauma, the trauma conversation, which is just absolutely fascinating and uh, groundbreaking right now, um, doing neurofeedback and having, having a QEEG on, um, and just doing, just doing other brain scans. They're like, Oh geez, you have, you have serious TBI. Like, you have traumatic brain injury. Did you ever get punched in the face? I'm like, have you seen my nose? Like I've got, what, what, like, I mean, I mean, by, by, by which, by, which side of my face? <laughs> um, uh, and so like, 
I didn't realize it. Like, okay, so on, on a TBI scan, like here's what we would consider to be really bad, you know, and here's where you are, which is like apparently like two points on the sliding scale worse. And they're like, so there's no, this is not like an emotional, a sheerly emotional thing that's manifesting in your life and causing these triggers. You actually have brain, you have brain damage. So I mean, there's physical trauma that's caught, that's also causing a lot of the things that you might be experiencing emotionally. So it's just, again, like you, you asked the question, it's, it's so complex. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, a lot of correlation and a lot of inter interconnectedness, um, between the two, the two worlds. Um, yeah, what I would, I mean, I could add plenty of, you know, pedram trauma stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the other fl flip side of that coin, um, for, uh, for this, uh, argument's sake here and talk about kind of the stuff that I, see, have seen, and became brutally aware of clinically. It's like, you know, IBS, digestive issues, as you've mentioned, but I've seen people go into full-blown autoimmunity. You know, I used to see a lot of people with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, which are, you know, kind of these kind of throwaway um, diagnoses of, we don't know what the hell to do with you. People that would go into lupus and into real se severe, you know, physiological duress um, and the unwind was nine times out of 10, you know, yeah, you fix lifestyle, you do the things you do as a doc, but nine times out of 10, it's like, hey, let's, uh, let's talk about your past because so something stuck here, right? And, um, and, and that was the thing, right? That would be the miraculous overhaul and, you know, health comes back and everything comes back because you just can't have that much unresolved pain in your system without things going awry, right? And, um, you could take that on a macro level. You could take that on a micro level. You know, Nick had migraines, you know, I, I ended up getting, you know, food, food issues later in life. And it you know, may or may not have had to do with like, you know, a very bad circumstance that I had to stomach through. Right. And so you, you figure that stuff out, you learn how to resolve that. And then all of a sudden, you know, this thing that all these doctors have been scratching their head over starts to get better. Right. And, and the flip side of that was also, you know, on the clinical side, it was just compliance. You know, we, someone would come in, we'd run a bunch of labs, we'd do a bunch of tests, you know, we'd do the doctor stuff and be like, Hey, hallelujah, check it out. You've got this, this, and this, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you better. No one else, no one's home. And they just wouldn't do it. And you're like, yo, man, you just came over here and gave me all this money. And we just spent two weeks of our life doing a bunch of stuff and poking and prodding and taking your blood pee and poop. And I got the answer. What gives? And, you know, at first I'd get mad and be like, this guy's such a loser. You know, these people, you know, what the hell? And then it just, as I matured into my thirties as from a young doc into, you know, an, an older, an older one, it just became so clear that the underlying trauma and the scripts and the negative memes and the self-sabotage that came from the trauma that was unresolved had this patient stuck in a place where they just weren't willing to commit to their own healing when we had the answer in front of them. And so then it started to become my study. I was like, oh, hold on a second. I don't care if rhodiola is good for you. If you're not going to do what I tell you, let's go there first, right? And, and it shifted the entire paradigm of how I practiced in, in, clinically. Yeah, that's such an important point, Pedram. I, I know I see the same thing often in clinic too, and it's... Um... It's this interesting mix to, depending on the person as far as where do you even start with it? Because like you were talking about, Nick, even if someone's been in trauma for a long time, I think a lot of times what people forget is that that actually has very physical ramifications of it. I mean, you can't be in a state of sort of whatever, maybe it's either fight or flight dominance or where the vagus nerve isn't working properly or something along these lines without having downstream effects. I mean, you create certain neuropeptides and chemicals in the body and hormonal changes that go on for a long period of time, which start to create all these troubles. So, you know, do you start on the physical level first or do you start on the mental emotional part first? And I find that such an individual thing. I've seen some people that are so depleted that for them to even start to do any kind of mental, emotional work with it, they got to get some of their foundational physical stuff on track first, just so they got the energy and the reserve to even put time into it. You know, it's like they're so depleted, they can't, you don't even know where to start. And I imagine probably for, for you, Nick, when you had had a traumatic brain injury, you would need to get certain physical stuff on track first before you could even do the next level of work. Whereas other yeah. people can't even do the physical stuff until they get the, the first part done. So definitely an individual thing. 
it's funny. Like I, I didn't know about the TBI stuff until literally like two years ago. And I feel like I've come, I've done quite a lot in my life and come a long way in the last 20 years since I healed the, the other symptoms of what was going on in my brain to your point. Like, you know, the idea of how do you get somebody unstuck? How do you take somebody who's the thing, the very thing that they're, they should be, they're using to process their reality is messed up. It's not like having a broken arm where you're like, okay, well I'm here, but this sucks. It's like the thing, like the actual thing that, that they're making decisions with is all messed up. How can they, how should they be able to be compliant? How should they be able to do the things they need to do for themselves? And when, just as you were saying that, and it's something that we, we speak about in the book, it's near and dear to both of our hearts is um, the idea of rites of passage and ceremony. Like the thing that shook me out of where I was, I was in a really dark place, you know, in that period of my life. And the thing that shook me out of it was an invitation to um, an invitation. I don't know how much how accepting, I'm sure you guys are very accepting of this, but an invitation to a plant medicine ceremony of sorts. Um, and uh, it was, I was like 20, 23 or 24. And I'd never really worked with, uh, with those types of substances before in any kind of a productive way. You know, I have been to college and done stupid things, but I mean, like never in a productive ceremonial way. And I was a mess and there was no like, Hey, you know, let's come back five times and do this, you know, over the course of like a month and a half, it was like, come tonight. It's going to be really intense. Um, you can trust this guy because he's one of my, this, the person who was making the, ref, the referral was one of my good friends. So I trusted the situation. It's going to be work, but tomorrow you're going to be, something's going to, something's going to feel different. And it was a serious rite of passage. The next day I was much more resourceful and there was a lot I'd been through it. And it was like, you know, it wasn't easy, but I mean, sometimes I feel like in those situations, when you want somebody needs it, what I, some of the shamans that I work with down in the jungle will call a shake up. They just need, they need something to shake them up at least enough to start taking action. It's not like you're going to be healed overnight by this one thing you do, but it's enough to shake you out of the groove you're in. If you're like, a, if you're a record, then the needles in one groove, you're not going to get out of that groove until somebody comes and bumps a record player. Well, that's, that's the way to do it. You know? Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if that's for everybody, but certainly a way to get yourself from where you are and wake yourself up to the fact that you even have a problem. Most people, don't even realize how much the pro how much they have a problem. They just know that, that their life sucks, but they don't even know why. A great way to get some perspective is to do any number of different ceremonial practices that involve some type of um, intentionally elevated intensity for a, a duration of time. It could be anything. It could be a sweat lodge. It could be, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do, do this, but that do not involve hallucinogenics. That's just one way, but rites of passage and ceremony are something that I don't think we have anymore. I mean, we, you know, when in our culture, like what are, what are the rites of passage? I mean, you know, if you looked at Native American tradition and other indigenous tradition, like there are rites of passage all over the place, you know, that really mark things that you see in your kids. We all have young kids. Like when you have young, when you have kids, you start realizing, oh, they, this actually is that every, at, at age seven, they do this special thing with the boys or whatever it is. And I, I you know, and you start looking at your kids and like, oh my God, he really does need this. He has changed or she has changed at age, age 13. Wow. She does need this. It's like, we don't have anything now. What, what's the rite of passage to get going, getting, getting your first communion or going and like getting your driver's license. Like there's no real deep spiritual rite of passage. And we're, we're sort of desperate for those to come back into our realities. Yeah. Or I, I, I even think like a lot of times the rites of passages have become like dysfunctional because they're not really sort of in this alignment of sort of like almost like an elder taking you through something. It becomes like you're in college and all your buddies and the rites of passage is something that's not so maybe yeah. appropriate or so beneficial for you or useful uh, as opposed to kind of having this, this real feeling of what a rites of passage is. Well, Nick, even when you were talking about the shakeup, we've spoken to a few yeah. people, including Huna Flash, who's a light Lemurian shaman. We featured him in the previous um, series and he speaks of this COVID era period as being a huge shakeup. And, and as far as the rites of passage ceremony, it's like we're all collectively going through that at this time, through this major shakeup that we have, uh, that we're all enduring, that we're all working through. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we, I blog about a lot about that and just interviews about that in the beginning of COVID, where, where it's like, if you just, if you stop and you treat this period of discomfort as a year long ceremony, then it could be a completely different a completely different experience for you, you know, and now that's easier said than done. You know, some people are trapped at home with their three kids in the South side of Chicago. That's, that's a lot. That's easy for me to say, right. but I mean, in general, the idea of, can you, 
can you, and this is for trauma in too, is like, can you turn this from a, can you transform this or transmute this experience from one that is you're the victim and this is a challenge that's been foisted upon you and now you have to deal with it to this is all medicine, everything is medicine, this experience is the next dose, you know, and how can I take my medicine and be fully present with it and try to try to be comfort, try to get as, and again, this is very easy for me to say, like somebody who's really suffering from severe trauma right now has, has a lot going on. I'm not trying to trivialize or minimalize any, anything, but I'm just saying if you can find the wisdom, if you can try to find that one seam that you can, you can stick to for the time being and just see the wisdom that's being delivered in the suffering, you know, this is very Buddhist and, you know, and we've got a Taoist monk here and, you know, we're all very, we've got a lot of that going on on the side of the equation, but if you can be, learn how to be comfortable or more comfortable with the discomfort, then you might find that there's, there's immense wisdom to be had. Beautiful. And I think part of our goal and even having this series is to bring on a host number of people who have personally worked through severe trauma. Like next week, um, we're, we're airing Kathy O'Brien's episode and she's been, she was born in the Illuminati and she was, you know, traumatized and abused as an infant for, for 30 years before she was finally, um, she finally escaped. But when, when we hear those stories, it provides inspiration for us and like, okay, there, it is possible. If somebody else can do it with that level of severity, then maybe there's something within me where, where there's a spark within me that can also come through and, and assist me at this time. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were talking about the importance of even being able to stay with some discomfort. I think that's that in itself, there's so much wisdom in that. And a lot of the people we've been talking to too, it's, it's this process of going back to the body. It's, it's not sort of staying up here. It's actually going back into the feeling center of the body, staying with aspects of what is not so comfortable. And, and then I think within that process, without trying to make it much more, there's sort of like um, realizations that take place. The body starts to share its, its innate wisdom with you if you stay and you're able to kind of stay long enough to listen. So what are some of the ways that you guys find that you can do that? Because that's a, that's a tricky one for people when the feeling sensation is so intense and yet so important to touch in on. So where do you start that process for people? I guess, you know, one of the things that, you know, you know, things have kind of moved since Marty Seligman's time, but there's this concept of positive psychology and kind of lengthening your fuse. Right. And um, I, I find that this conversation around resilience and the building of resilience is really important because you need to have enough energy. You need a long enough fuse to be able to kind of turn that light of awareness around and introspect on some of this stuff um, from a place of equanimity as best you can. Because if not, it's just going to knock you off your perch. You're going to get triggered and, you know, down the white water you go. Right. And so there are a number of kind of palliative things that kind of help take the edge off. But then there are, I mean, there's this vast encyclopedia of lifestyle wisdom that we know are fuse lengthening practices, like do your yoga, do Tai Chi, take a walk in, in nature. Uh, you know, all of these uh, eat well, right? So you build the resilience, you build the protective factors for the individual to feel safe. Um, and as you start to strengthen the individual to have enough energy and agency to deal with this stuff, then... Look, I mean, we, like I said, we wrote a book and did a 10 part series on this. There's a lot of ways up the mountain, but there are really great somatic therapies. There's obviously like ketamine and psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. There are really very interesting new modalities that are allowing the like full brain coherence and putting someone in a place where they can have, um, an activated full brain while engaging in some of this kind of limbic emotional content that brings resolution and healing much more effectively than sitting on the couch for eight years of psychoanalysis, right? And so if you're, if you're listening to this right now and you are suffering from trauma, and I used to think trauma was like, hey, I didn't get raped. You know what I mean? Like the, I, I, I know, like I, I have a cousin who jumped off a building. Like my trauma was, my trauma was, you know, the experience of having a person in my life die his trauma was, you know, being so miserable, he had to kill himself, right? And so there's different gradations. So you're like, dude, I'm fine, 
right? But then you start to do an accounting of all the stuff in your own life that led to all these kind of micro decisions and little things that you do traumatically. And so, look, if you're listening to this, you've got trauma. Now the question is, what do you got to do to resolve it? Um, I invite you to look at the new stuff out there. I mean, obviously Nick and I, you know, covered a lot of it in the book and in the, in the, you know, series that we have on whole TV, but it's just still like scratching the surface of the amazing work that has been done. There's an amazing body of work that has kind of come to the forefront of the psychological revolution and all these things that are, that, that are happening that doctors talk about, but someone who's sitting here listening with trauma right now might not know that there are some incredible innovations in the, the treatment and the resolution of trauma that you need to know about. It's easier. It's, be, it's, 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 we're getting better at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely moving from just, I think a lot of times people think trauma means I just need to talk it out and there's so many other ways. And actually we, we dove deep into working with trauma several years ago. So which kind of ties me to the other question is, um, and then we'll share our experience with that too, but how can people develop trauma before they're even aware that they can even remember it? So when we tie back even to like birth and, and that sort of stuff, maybe share a little bit around that. How about your mom smoking a crack pipe <laughs> in utero, right? I mean, how about your parents getting into a fight, um, a really bad fight that caused emotional suffering and strain? How about living in Los Angeles in the 70s and huffing paint and, uh, you know, breathing smog every day of their lives? How about dot, dot, dot? I mean, what do you think that kid's not alive? The kid's sitting there taking mom's blood. Every, you know, every thing of Velveeta that mom ate before we realized that, you know, food matters. It's on that, it's on that scoreboard. Yeah. You know, I, I remember when I was going through training in osteopathy and uh, when we were doing our we we're doing one of the courses on embryology and they were basically saying, you know, as soon as the neural tube starts to get developed, which is between about week three and four, that now that child is directly linked to mom's nervous system. So whatever is going on with mom is going to directly affect that child. They're sort of very much in sync. And, you know, we and will share this story because it was such a profound one for us. But after our, our second child, um, who's just about four now, <clears throat> and I remember we were going through stuff and Taylor was going through a lot of like pretty intense overwhelm around things. And so we were, we were just trying to test to figure out what was going on and where the heart of it was. And so I, I was incorporating a technique called neuroemotional therapy would help to kind of narrow down some of the, there's lots of different ways to look at it. And it came down and we were looking and um, came down to looking at a time frame on when it developed. And it actually was before birth. And which was, which was odd and actually came up at around seven months gestation. So it was the feeling, the emotion that, that was being, <clears throat> that was guiding us to this particular timeline. So the intensity, mm -hmm. the restlessness, the discomfort within my body kind of guided, facilitate, uh, facilitated this process to be able to kind of exactly figure out at what point in time did this actually trigger yeah. or activate. And the emotion that was up, it was around unlovability or not being lovable. Well, as soon as even like Jay asked me a series of questions and sitting with the intensity of that emotion, being guided to that particular timeline, it's like the body leads you there, right? It's within this, it's all held within the body. So as soon as um, he asked me to stay with it, and I think he posed a few words, the word unlovability came up and it was like, I started bawling. <laughs> like I, it was, it was so this primal knowing that that was at the heart of what was coming up. So even the restlessness, the, the discomfort that was coming up for me and was speaking very loudly and clearly for days on weeks on before that period, when we actually took the time and the space to sit with it and listen to it, the body speaks very clearly and you know it because you tap into it, not from a logical point of view or a rational point of view, but it's this feeling sense of primal, like, oh, that's it. <laughs> well, and the part that was really fascinating was that it was about seven months gestation or seven months while she was still in her mom's womb. And then as we kind of found out, 
this was so I was born during the revolution mm -hmm. in Iran. So my mom was a was a high ranking police officer at that time. She was in uniform walking in um, on the streets on the sidewalk. And um, a very religious lady approached her and, and asked her, uh, lady, just tell me today, are you for the Shah or against the Shah? And my mom was very much for the Shah. So she stood a little bit taller and said, I will forever stand with the Shah. And the lady punched her in the stomach and my mom passed out. <clears throat> but it was- When she was seven months. When she was seven months pregnant with me. Yeah, so it's, it was really interesting because that instant, that, that particular scenario took me to that period of time that I wouldn't even have logically connected with if it was talk therapy, right? And fast forward two generations now from that event. Mm -hmm. <sighs> right. Crazy. Well, and that's where you kind of see, like when you guys talked at the beginning around just sort of the far reaching effects of trauma. It's like, these are the kind of things where I feel like when, when we've got these patterns that a lot of times we don't even know about, or, or, you know, you weren't even, you weren't even technically here on the planet in the same way to even be able to experience it. Now, whether that's an experience like that, or if it's a traumatic birthing experience or, you know, a cord tied around or, or whatever was going on in the relationship, like you talked about Pedram too, um, all of those things sort of set up certain patterns and then it seems like what we do when we come out is we just sort of unconsciously run through these patterns over and over and over again which kind of ties me to how do you know even when you start to question how do you know when you are acting from a place that is being triggered more from our trauma where we're acting so we are being drawn towards something or drawn away from something because of our trauma body or our pain body versus when we're actually connected more to something that is um, more connected to like a source or, or, or a higher intelligence or our pure, our, our genuine authentic self. How do we know the difference when we're going through life to be able to discern? Uh, that's a, that's a very, um, <laughs> that's a tough question to answer. For me, it comes down to whether I, I know my purposes. I know why I'm here. I know what I want to get done. And when I'm heading in that direction, it's very conspicuous now when there are energy, I, I, I notice it very heavily when you tune into, start tuning into these things, when there's something, a voice in my head telling me that I'm not enough or telling me that this, that, that just loading my, the ticker tape of thought behind my eyelids with information that's not serving those higher, higher objectives. And I think that when you, I guess something that we should talk about that is that's at the heart of it for me, um, and I, we mentioned in the book is the idea of starting to be able to be starting to detect subtle energies. Like most of us are going through the world trying to numb out. That's what, that's kind of you know you see the opioid epidemic that's taking you know taking the world by storm right now. People don't want to feel these things. There's a lot of that's happened. People don't want to feel. People don't. Um, they don't know what's there and they don't want to know what's there. And when you start opening yourself up to the pain um, and opening yourself up to all the sensations and realizing that pain is just a word that's slapped onto a number of different sensations that are going on in your reality and behind, behind the scenes, you start detecting these subtle energies and you start, when you start, it's almost like learning how to taste wine. Like if you give somebody, you know, three glasses of wine and they don't know how, they don't know how to detect what's good, what's bad. They're not going to know the differences, but when you start, whatever it is, it could be any kind of a hobby, any kind of a, any kind of a food. Um, once you start examining things and you start, you'll start noticing the subtleties that make things different from each other. When you start noticing those subtle energies, they become louder and it becomes easier to, to detect them. So things that might've derailed you, you know, 10 years ago, you see them for exactly for what they are. Like, Whoa, that is not me. That's absolutely not me. It's either my trauma or their trauma or their shade they're throwing. This isn't me. Cool. I can work with that. I can move forward. Um, so in answer to your question, how do you know when you're acting from trauma or acting from who you actually are? I think the, I, the, the notion of learning how to detect subtle energies in your reality and stop, stop thinking you know so much about what these things actually are and just start experiencing them. Start figuring out what's making you feel good, what's making you not feel good, what's empowering towards your life, life's goals and what's, what's holding you back. Some things are, are, some things are important. Like, you know, again, we, we've heard the, you know, the, the analogy of like fight or flight, if there's a tiger chasing you, dude, it's great, that's real, run. But I mean, there's no reason for me to have that same level of fear on a regular basis when I walk into a place that has people in it that I don't know. 
Like I should be able to walk through the world. I should be able to move through this reality, feeling safe on a regular basis, unless there's something that's actually a threat. But if I'm always feeling threatened, if I'm always getting triggered by things, I have to start looking at those subtle energies. I have to start looking at what's compounding to make me, to derail me the way I'm being derailed. So for me, the idea of, of starting to taste your reality like a fine wine and understanding what different situations are. It's not all cut and dry. This is a very com complex landscape, emotional landscape, spiritual landscape that we're trying to navigate. And it's beautifully complex. It's wonderful when you start actually acknowledging what's going on, as opposed to just looking here, try not to think too hard and just get through. Yeah. I, I like that. Taste your reality like a fine wine. Um, definitely, definitely adds a layer of sort of self-inquiry and introspection and curiosity about just what, what's going on, what's, what's really going on without kind of being on autopilot the whole time. I wanted to ask you guys, because um, we all have kids here, um, how are you choosing to raise your children in as far as the regular school system, public school system, I don't think cuts it. It doesn't create the... Um, the work or the space to really be able to teach our kids effectively and even working with any emotions whatsoever. Um, aside from the indoctrination that we're seeing so clearly right now, especially, but what are the school systems are, that you guys are looking at? How are you choosing to, um, to raise your children? <laughs> the topic. Dr. Sojai, please weigh in. <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, tag. Um, we we had moved to Park City, Utah. We went to a private school, um, which ended up not being great, and we had some issues. Um, you know, um, the same issues actually. Interesting. You know how trauma kind of repeats. Is like all these kids are running around being monkeys, yet my little brown boy was getting singled out. And so, you know, thank, you know, thank you Nazis um, for continuing to exist. So, you know, we called them out and, you know, basically um, we're done. And then the pandemic hit, we uh, brought them home and homeschooled them mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And then um, there were days where I'd walk out of my home office and be like, I need to pull my wife off these kids. Cause they're about to they're, like, it, it wasn't pretty. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, we are going back to another school and we have decided to, um, not homeschool or unschool, um, because my kids are very social and, um, you know, the, the, the cost of isolation was, was getting to be a lot now, like my son, um, could make the Olympic team if he keeps skiing, you know, they're mountain biking and skiing, they're out in the woods all the time. And, you know, they're, they're, we're putting them in a lot of different sports the other day. I chuckled because he was just being an asshole to his sister. And I was like, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to go hunt rabbits. <laughs> he's seven. So I said, great. So I had him whittle a spear and with a knife and taught him how to cut away from his body. And we sat out there in the freaking woods waiting for a rabbit for like two hours. He didn't see a rabbit or kill a rabbit, but his behavior completely modified and went back to where it should be because he got to express his little, you know, rite of passage hunter genes. And so, you know, I've just doubled down on leaning in and, and, and letting this animal grow into the body that, it, you know, it inherited while um, also not like being too delicate. Like I let them punch bullies. Like I was like, you never hit somebody or bully somebody. But if someone bullies you and you tell them to stop and they don't, you punch them right in the mouth. Um, I'm a martial artist. Right. And, and I'm like, you know, I, I will not let hurt people hurt my people. Right. And so like, there are a lot of people who inflict trauma on others. Mm -hmm. And Nick and I had a chuckle about this. Cause you know, deep down, like if when I see a kid being an asshole, there's a part of me that wants to punch his dad. Cause I know where it came from. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's all, these are all just chains of trauma that, that travel downstream and upstream that we need to look at and resolve. And some of it isn't all just like talk. Some of it is just really good boundaries and, you know, a good fighting stance sometimes. And it's, it's a complicated world and there are animals that will eat you and humans are animals too. And so, you know, we're, we're learning. We have another book slash 10 part series on conscious parenting coming and we're taking a oh, cold wonderful. hard look at some of these, these influences that are turning our kids into inert little video game players, but not, you know, strong individuals in a, in a society that can stand up for themselves. 
So I don't agree with all the literature. And I think that there needs to be a reckoning because I want my kids to grow up strong and have great boundaries and be able to defend themselves and defend other kids against bullies. Yeah, I, I totally hear you on that, Petrum. I, uh, I grew up doing martial arts too and competed for Canada for a long time. And I've got two little girls and uh, I mean, and I want them to be fierce in a certain way. And I want them to know where those boundaries are. And I want them to know how to take care of themselves because I think that's really important. And it was a game changer for me. And I got bullied when I was a kid. And it's like when I moved into martial arts, that was on, on a lot of aspects. I mean, it's not even that I had to use it all the time or anything, but it just, it, it gave me a different sensation inside my body where then I think that projects out and then you don't even have to use it a lot of times, but it's nice to know that it's there. Um, one maybe final question, because I know you guys are on time here, but um, what you had mentioned was really important because it ties into trying to prevent trauma from occurring in our kids that sometimes unintentionally happens through parenting. And this, uh, we'll, we'll connect with you guys down the road here because we'll definitely want to talk to you about the Conscious Parenting Series because that's such a big, important part. But what you talked about, Pedram, was, was allowing. You know, when it talked about those five basic needs of attention, affection, appreciation, acceptance, and allowing, you kind of taking your son and making a spear and taking him out there was allowing him, you had some structure, but you allowed him mm -hmm. to be himself and to act from what he knew he felt like drawn to do. So maybe kind of in sum up, we can talk a little bit just about those five basic needs kind of tied in with parenting, because as much as we all need to resolve our own trauma, I think ultimately to be able to parent even more effectively. Um, those are some really good guidelines for what can create trauma in kids that if we as parents or new parents are learning, uh, learn those right now so that we don't have to kind of keep creating this cycle of trauma that occurs. Yeah. Ain't, ain't, ain't that the work ahead of all of us? I mean, Nick and I spent a lot of time talking about this and, you know, look, we all got messed up and we're trying our best not to mess them up. But I also think that the narratives in the culture are creating, um, they're pigeonholing us in places where we're not allowing um, yeah. these, these creatures to express um, and be the best that they can be. Um, and I mean, there's just, a, there's just, there's a lot of pain around making bad decisions and not being present. So I think, you know, rule number one with conscious parenting is the word conscious is you have to, and Nick was talking about this earlier, you have to develop a certain level of self-awareness so that you know you're coming from your triggered, traumatized self and shift into a different mindset with that delicate little bird in front of you in this you know, instrumental moment that's going to drive a lot of good or bad decisions for the rest of their life, right? It's, that's a tremendous responsibility, but it's on us to, you know, not drink the Dr. Pepper and not watch the dumb TV show and not get numbed into this obscure idiocrity of, of our culture that then allows our kids to be parented by iPads, right? And so, I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. I, it's a can of worms that I don't want to open right now, but, you know, suffice it to say, these are all interconnected, right? How we come to awareness. And look, if you're not aware enough to check your own stuff, your wife's probably tell, nagging you about it. Maybe you should listen to what she's saying, right? Your kids are probably calling you out on stuff. And so we just got to learn to listen. And if we can't listen to our thoughts yet, at least listen to the loved ones that are telling you you're messing up. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say an answer to the, the question, last question um, about schooling. My oldest son, um, River, he's eight. Um, he's in public school right now. We put him in a bunch of other schools. I mean, you know, he's been in Waldorf, he's been in Montessori, he's been in some crazy, you know, Harvard thingy that was in Berkeley when we lived there. Um, turns out public school is good for him. I mean, I'm in Boulder, so public school is basically like, you know, it's like full on, kind of like private school. But the, the idea for us with him and probably with, with our youngest too is, we're going to be able to raise this child 25% of the way. The, war, the rest of the world is going to raise him the rest of the 75%. And I guess what I'm starting to realize with him is I was guarding his experience pretty intensely for a long time because I was bullied too. And, um, it toughened me up, but it also left a lot of scars. And so I was like, okay, I need to be able to sort of steer him around some of this, the BS that happened. And, and I, the, I realized the more he did it, uh, the, the more, um, neurotic he started becoming he actually started becoming you could just feel it like he was not 
he was not experiencing his reality the way that he should be. He was not interacting with his reality the way that we saw him interacting with his reality when he had more freedom. So we started going by this, this kind of uh, this new mantra where it's like, Hey, that boy is going to experience trauma. It's just going to happen. It's fine. He's being bullied right now. I wish I could call out the bully right now in this podcast would be hilarious, but it's cool. And it's painful to me. And like, I find myself the, the idea of punching the dad, like, this is a very real, like as in last week conversation um, with, with Pedro and I, between Pedro and I, I'm realizing that 75% of the pain is being felt by me, him. He, he goes to bed the next morning. He's like, up and ready to go to school again. But for me, I'm like, no, this is so, this means so much more than what you think it means. So I'm imposing myself on my kid, which is definitely not an isolated event. I think we all do it. Um, are you really going to try to protect your kid from trauma? Good luck. And I don't know if I want to know that kid when they're a teenager or a 20 year old, they're probably not going to leave your house. I think a lot of the work with parenting when it comes to trauma is our own trauma healing. I need to heal my, my trauma from bullying fully to allow him to go get bullied, come home and talk to me about it and not be worried. He's going to trigger me or make me angry when he tells me about it. And the more I do that, the more I let these things happen, the more he gets seasoned by his reality. And I think that for us, at least in the Polizzi household, uh, the idea is don't try to avoid the pain. Just know that we're here. Let's all talk about it when it happens. Learn the lesson. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's such such sage advice. You know, it makes me think of um, Dr. Stuart Shanker out, out here in Canada, who's a, one of the main self regulation uh, experts. And you know, I'll get kids that'll come in with depression or anxiety or ADHD or whatever it is, and the parents are wanting to kind of figure out how to how to fix them. And, and a lot of it, like his work would say, it all starts with the parent first. It's like, you literally are the template for their prefrontal cortex. So if you're not in a self-regulated place, do not expect that your kids are going to be able to, because we're actually wired to be able to do it and they're still not yet. So if we're having troubles, there's no way they're going to be able to. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's the starting place for all of us. So Guys, uh, thanks so much. That was uh, that was Thank awesome. I feel time. like I could talk to you guys for another couple of hours and maybe we'll try and set up something else down the road here. But um, where can people learn more about the work that you guys are doing collectively and also individually? Uh, collectively, uh, we're the founders of whole.tv, W-H-O-L-E.tv. Lots of our film series, lots of courses, uh, master classes, office hours with experts, lots of cool stuff that we put together there. It's a great, great place to hang. Uh, and then on my side, theurbanmonk.com written with this guy, I've written three books. I got eight books under my belt and, you know, just a bunch of online learning, personal development, Taoist Qigong stuff. And Nick? Thesacredscience.com. Um, got a pretty thriving blog, a bunch of documentaries and docu-series. We're just, as you mentioned in my bio in the beginning, we're just poking at the fabric of this reality to try to figure out where there's information that could be helpful that we haven't really been shown. Yeah, uh, wonderful. I, I love the work you guys are doing both together and individually. So thank you guys so much for being a part of this series. And um, we look forward to connecting again. Thank yeah. you for your time. A real Thanks, pleasure. Guys. Thank you. Thank yeah. you both.